All right, um, last time we talked about continuations, and uh, today we'll expand more on what continuations allow us to do. So many programming languages offer tools for, oh, oops, offer tools for concurrency, concurrency. So what is concurrency? Traditionally, when people think about currency, they think about the idea of a thread. So the idea of a thread is, is that you have one process. So one process. And normally there's only one thing happening inside of it. And that is a thread. But if there are multiple threads, then now there are two things happening. And in, importantly, these are the same process, meaning that they share the same memory and resources as opposed to being totally separate processes, like if you just ran two programs on your computer. Okay, so what does it mean for there to be a thread? Like it's one thing that's running inside of your process and then um, there's another one. So I mean, if you think of it like this, a process is a combination of resources plus a list of threads. Okay, so the process stores resources like memory, files, access permissions, things like that, and then it has some threads. But now what is a thread? Intuitively, the idea of a thread is the stuff that your computer, that the program's doing. Okay, but what exactly does that mean, the stuff that your, your program is doing? Um, it can't be memory, because that's part of resources. It must be something else. Well, it turns out that what a thread is, is really just a continuation. Meaning that in terms of the CEK machine, basically you can think of there being something like the CEKT machine, that's the EK with threads, there would be the currently active code, there would be the um, environment, for that currently active code. There'd be the current continuation, and then there'd be more continuations for the other threads. Um, and these continuations uh, are basically suspended threads that would be run in the future if, uh, if you know, when, when they were ready to run. Um, notice that they don't need to control container C because they already have whatever work they're going to do inside of them, and they don't need to con they don't need to contain an environment because continuations already embed whatever the environment is. So let's take this concept right here um, and implement that not as an additional machine, the CKT machine. Instead, let's we can implement it directly in the language because we have first class continuations. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll define um, a global variable, and I'm writing this, this, what I'm writing right now is a J program. We're not writing that, so we're, we're writing a J program. So we'll write a global variable called readyq that's going to start off as the empty list. By the way, when I write define like this, what I mean is that you would include this in your standard library. And so your standard library would take these defines and just stick them inside of a let that, um, uh, or sorry, a let rec that's just around everything. Okay, so we have this ready queue, and this is going to be the, the set of all possible, um, uh, the set of all the threads. Then we're going to define a function that's called spawn. And spawn is going to take as an argument a function. And what it's going to do is it's going to do set of the ready queue to a cons of f and the ready queue. So basically what spawn is going to do is it's going to put something at the front of the ready queue. All right. Then we're going to find another function that's called exit. 
and exit is going to take no arguments. And what it's going to do is it's going to say, um, I guess we'll do a case. It's going to do a case on the ready queue of if there's an in left, that means it's empty, then all we're going to do is we're just going to return unit. So we're just going to do nothing. And if there's something, that means that there's a pair. In which case, what we'll do is we will begin and then set the ready queue to be equal to the second thing inside of the pair. And then what we'll do is we'll call the first thing in the pair. And we'll give it no arguments. Okay, so we'll take the pair and we'll pull off the first thing and call that function, which spawn put in, right? And otherwise we'll do that. Okay, so now what this means is that we can write programs that um, call spawn and, um, and exit, and spawn will create a new thread, and then exit will um, stop the current thread and then go switch and run the next one. Okay, now the thing though is, is that um, this setup right here, actually let me write a little example program. So we could write a program like spawn lambda, and then, I don't know, we could like do plus two, four, exit. This is a very boring program. And then we could do another spawn plus two, three, exit. And then we could call exit. And now what this program is going to do is when we will spawn two threads and then we'll kill the main thread and then this one will run and then that one will run. Now what I recommend doing is adding to your CK machine some way to do like a print. So we could like print this and then we could actually see that it was happening. You know what I mean? That these other things were happening. But in real programming, um, threads are most useful um, when they can communicate with one another um, rather than only through memory. What I mean by that, rather than only through memory, is that, as I mentioned here, threads share the same resources, i.e. they share the same memory. And in our code, that would mean that these lambdas right here would share the same variables. So we could like put these inside of a let that would have, you know, some memory. And now all of them would be able to modify that. Thus they would be able to communicate with one another. However, um, it's very difficult to directly huh, modify memory like that and write a correct program. So instead what people do is they build um, concurrency abstractions. Now, um, many concurrency abstractions are based around the idea of locking, which you may have heard of before. Um, intuitively, a lock is like, uh, you know, a variable is in a secret room, and if you want to go look at it, you have to unlock the door, go inside, and then you lock the door behind you, and this guarantees that only one person is there at the same time. So maybe like, think of it like a safety deposit box. Um, we're going to we're going to talk about a um, another kind of abstraction for um, for concurrency, which is called message passing concurrency. And message passing concurrency has the advantage of um, not having what are called races. Um, if you've taken the operating systems class, you talk a lot about uh, these issues there. So we're going to have a very small amount of that. Okay, so message passing concurrency, what it does 
is it instead uses an abstraction called a channel. And the idea of a channel is that a channel is a spot. It's like a queue where there can be um, there can be senders that put stuff into the queue. So they'll put like an A there, and then another one will come, and they'll put a B in, and so on. And on the other side, there are receivers, and what they do is they take stuff out. Now, um, if a sender, oh yeah, and here's the other important thing. Um, it is synchronous, so channels are synchronous. So what does that mean, synchronous? It means that if you send, you block until it is received. So if I want to send you a message and you're not ready to take it, then I just stand there waiting for you to take the message. And if you want to receive a message and there's none there, and, and there's no senders waiting, then you just sit there and wait. So it's entirely synchronous. So let's implement that. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a function that's called make channel. And it's a, a lambda and it's going to return a box. And inside the box is going to be um, is going to be empty. All right. Next, we've got to write the send function. So send is going to take two uh, values. It's going to take the channel box, so that's the box for the channel. And it's going to take the value that we want to send. OK. So what we're going to do is we are going to do a case on the unboxing of the channel. Now, if we open up the channel and the box is empty, then that means that no one is waiting to receive it. In which case, we have to postpone doing the send. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a let CC and capture our continuation. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do a set box on that channel. And we are going to put on a cons of an in left of a pair of v, the value that we want to send, and k, our continuation. And we'll close that. And then after the cons, um, we'll just be um, we'll just be empty. And we'll close the cons, we'll close the set box, and then we'll call exit. And the reason that we're calling exit is because we are waiting for someone to be ready to receive and no one's there, so that means that we have to save our work for later and then let someone else do it. So hopefully they will be the one that wants to receive. 
Now, if there was something that was actually in the list, then we're going to do an in write. So then there's going to be an in write. And if there's an in write, then that means that there's something actually in there. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, made a, I made a little mistake. Um, okay, we gotta revise this. All right. So what we're gonna do is this is gonna be unbox of the box. So we're gonna cons on whatever was there before. Now we're not gonna we're not gonna directly case on um, the channel. We're gonna case on um, on whatever the first thing inside of the channel is, and so. We're going to call a function that's going to be called first star, and we're going to give it the unbox. Let me let me just make some space. We're going to call first star on unbox of the channel B, and then um, we're going to pass in a default argument which is going to be in left false. All right. Now, what's this first star function? Let me uh, go over here. So first star is a function that takes in a list and then a default. And what it does is we say, um, uh, is we do a case L of if the list is empty then there's a left and so we're gonna return the default and if there's a right then we're gonna return the first thing inside of it okay so basically the idea is that we're gonna get whatever the first thing is or we're gonna get the default so in this case we know that the box that said the channel is a list, and so we'll either get an in left false, which is this case, or we'll get whatever the first thing actually is. And the contents of this box are going to be lefts and right. Where if there's a left, then that means that we are waiting um, to be, uh, uh, then that means that there's no, sorry, a left is going to be someone waiting to send, and a right is going to be someone waiting to receive. So if there's a right, then that means that there is a continuation that's waiting to receive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new thread. So we're going to spawn a new thread where we're going to call that continuation with our value. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set the box, which I will be, to rest star of unbox channel B empty. And what's rest star? Rest star is just like this, except that in um, if there's a in left, then we return the default, and if there's an in right, we return the second. So rest star is the same, except that says second. Okay, so this is the implementation of send. If the first thing inside of the channel is an in left, meaning that it's either empty or someone is waiting to send, then we put ourselves as someone else that wants to send. And if it's an in right, then that means someone is waiting to receive, so then we spawn a new thread, taking their continuation and sending our value there. So let's look at how um, receive works. So define receive. 
is a function. that takes one argument, which is the channel. What we'll do is we will, uh, let's define um, channel L to be equal to unbox of channel B inside of calling case of first star channel L and then in write false. So the idea here is, is that we're going to look at the first thing and we're going to assume that it's going to be someone waiting to receive. If it's not someone waiting to receive and we get an in left, then this in left was put in by someone waiting to send. So what we'll do is we'll let z equal first p in letting k equal the second p in spawning a new thread where we're going to call that k with unit because this k right here was someone else calling send and so we're going to make it so that their send is going to return unit which is like returning void and then what we're going to do is that we are going to set box the channel B with rest star channel L empty. And then we're going to return V. And if instead no one was waiting to send, then what we're going to do is we're going to let C see ourself. And then we're going to set box channel B to a cons of an in right of our continuation and the channel L. Close the cons, close the set box. And then we're going to call exit because we hope that some other thread is going to be the one that actually does ascend on us. Then we'll close the case, close the let, close the lambda, close the define. Okay, so these functions here, what they do is they make it so that sends and receives can collaborate together. So we can write example programs like We could write a program like, um, like let channel equals make channel, make channel in spawn a new thread that does ascend to that channel five and then call receive on that channel. And this program is going to evaluate to five because we add something to the queue. We call receive. There's nothing there. Therefore, we get added to um, the channel list. Then we call the thread. Then we call exit, which calls the next thread in the queue, which calls this one. This send goes in, sees that there is a um, uh, sees that there is a uh, someone waiting to receive calls that continuation, then calls exit. Well, this the function calls exit. Um, and then we're good to go. Um, you can create you know, large networks of functions that all work together. You could write a function that like infinitely uh, does stuff. So like here's one that we could do. We could write let channel equals make channel. in spawn a new thread that does let i 
equals zero in while true. And then we can do send of the channel i and then set i equal to i plus one. And then close that, close that, close that. And then we could do something like plus receive from the channel plus receive from the channel receive from the channel and this is going to be equal to 3 because this one's going to return 0 that one's going to return 1 and that one's going to return 2 this thread right here never exits it keeps running forever but um, but it since it uh, is uh, synchronous every one of these sends will wait until the next one is there now there are a large number of other things that you can implement um, once you have message passing concurrency like this so you can implement things like locks so you could implement a lock like this you could define a function define a function called make lock that takes no arguments okay takes no arguments and what it's going to do is it is going to um, make a new channel so we'll say define lock channel which it calls make channel Then what we're going to do is we're going to define a new thread. And what this thread is going to do is it's going to do while true. And then while true, it is going to define a new channel called the unlock channel. Close that, close that. And then what it's going to do is it's going to send after calling receive, it's going to it's going to receive from the lock channel a value, which it's then which is going to be its own channel, which it's going to send, and it's going to return it, the thing that it's going to send is a lambda that's going to call send on the unlock channel with unit. So we're going to close the send, close the lambda, close the send, and then it's going to call receive on that unlock channel. Let me close the receive, close the while, close the spawn, and then we're going to return the lock channel. Close the lambda, close the make lock. And then we're going to define a function that's called um, that's called lock, and it will take as an argument that lock channel. What it's going to do is it's going to define the reply channel as make channel. Then what we're going to do is we're going to call send to the lock channel and we're going to send it the reply channel. So we're sending to the lock channel the reply channel, so that's what this is. So we are, this receive right here is going to wait and serialize the people trying to send this. And the thing that they send is going to be this reply channel. So now that this code up here knows what the reply channel is, it can now send to it, and it can send to it this function. So what we're going to do is we're going to call receive on the reply channel, and then we're going to wait for this lambda to come back. And that lambda is going to have a function which we can call later when we're ready to unlock. And now this thread right here is just going to block and wait because it's going to wait to receive on that unlock channel that it made. And that means that other people who go in and call the lock won't be able to send anything to the lock channel because this receive won't happen and the lock channel is something um, that only this code 
um, knows about for how to receive. We can make this a little bit more powerful by actually making it so that um, by actually making it so that rather than that's the right way to say this rather than returning the lock channel directly we could actually return calling lock on the lock channel and make it so that this code returns a lambda. So the idea here is that now um, nobody knows about the lock channel except this code it's protected inside of this uh, lambda and so that means that the only thing that you can, when you call make lock you just get back a function that you can call to lock and then it returns a function that you call to unlock and then there's no other way to access it. This pattern right here where a synchronous service um, creates a thread that manages interactions with the a channel is a very common thing to do in message passing uh, concurrency. There's another um, kind of concurrency primitive that's really common called a future or a promise. These are very common um, in JavaScript. And we can implement them the following way. We write define. Basically, the idea of a future is it's a computation that will be um, will be completed in the future, but you don't you're not necessarily sure when. And when you're ready to receive the final value, you call future value on it, and then if it's not ready yet, it will be forced to be ready, and you potentially block. So it's called um, optimistic concurrence, optimistic parallelism. So we would call a function called make future that's going to take as an argument a function f. And this function f is going to compute the value of the future. And how it's going to work is it's going to define a reply channel. So we define this reply channel. Then what we do is we create a new thread. And what this thread does is it's going to define a value v, which is a result of calling the function f. And then, while true, it's going to send to the reply channel the value. Close the send, close the while, close the lambda, close the spawn. OK. So now, basically what's going to happen is that this future is going to figure out what the value is and then repeatedly send it to the reply channel. Then what we're going to return from the future is we're going to return a function that's going to call receive on the reply channel. Close the receive, close the lambda, close the define. So now you call make future, you get back a function that you call later to get the value, but this value will be computed in another thread. And it will be continually available forever. Um, there's a huge number of, um, of such concurrency primitives, and um, doing message passing concurrency is a very popular um, way of organizing your concurrency. And I highly recommend that you um, check it out. Uh, you can learn more um, about it. Um, all right, one last thing. Um, if you wanted, what you could do is you could um, add uh, special channels to your machine. Um, for things like standard I.O. So you could make it so that there was like a channel name standard input where when you called receive on it, what that did is that the CEK machine knew about that and now it like went and called read character or something like that. Um, and that would be a way of making it so that um, you could safely, uh, safely add um, non-blocking uh, I.O to your code and cooperate with the rest of your threading system. And in fact, if we did that, basically you keep working on this and that's what Node.js is. Node.js is just the V8 interpreter for, um, 
for JavaScript combined with a threading library like we just wrote, combined with um, uh, with modifying the CK machine so it knows about the threading system so that when you call um, certain uh, you know functions to access um, uh, input sources, um, it will hide that behind the concurrency that's built into Node.js. So you could do that if you wanted. Um, it's one of the extra credit things. All right, that's all for today. Thanks.